Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome one and all to Ringmaster Storytime. I am your ringmaster and host, Jonathan Lee Iverson. Thank you for tuning in before you turn in. Remember, if you like this or any other content on my page, remember to subscribe or like. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome one and all. We're gonna get things started with our first story of the evening. Now imagine this was a time where women, young women, women of all ages were told what they can't do, how they can't live and who they can't be. But the subject of our first story had other ideas. Check it out. Marvelous Maddie, how Margaret E. Knight became an inventor by Emily Arnold McCulley. Maddie Knight lived in a little house in York, Maine, with her widowed mother and older brothers, Charlie and Jim. They were poor, but Maddie didn't feel poor. She had inherited her father's toolbox. When she thought of things that could be made with the tools, she drew them in a notebook labeled, My Inventions. Her brothers called the sketches her brainstorms. Maddie made a whirly gig for Charlie and a jumping jack for Jim. For her mother, who sat up late on cold nights sewing to earn a living, she made a foot warmer. In the spring, Charlie and Jim said, Won't you make us a special kite? Maddie sketched a few kites with different shapes and struts. She picked the best one and set to work on it. What's Maddie doing now? Their mother asked. She's had a brainstorm, the boy said. The mother shook her head. Maddie was a strange girl, she thought, happiest with her pencil, her jackknife, and her hammer. Maddie and the boys took the finished kite to Ward's Hill. Jim ran with it into the wind. Faster, Maddie called. The kite trembled briefly, took a dive, then rose on a sudden gust. Yahoo! Charlie yelled. The kite soared higher and higher. Who made that? Some town boys asked. Maddie made it. <laughs> she didn't. A girl couldn't make that. The following winter, Maddie made sleds for Charlie and Jim, and they won every race down Ward's Hill. Four boys asked Maddie to make sleds for them to race. It'll cost you a quarter apiece, Maddie said. The boys agreed, and every afternoon after school, Maddie worked on the sleds. She gave the money to her mother, but the family was still poor. When Maddie was 11, Mrs. Knight gathered the children together and said, I've heard there are jobs in the textile mills in Manchester, New Hampshire. The boys and I will work, and Maddie will go to school until she is 12. The company will rent us a house. Manchester was a brand new brick town. With her family gone for 13 hours every day, Maddie was lonely. After school, while she waited for them to come home, she liked to explore the complex of mills, but the overseers chased her from the spinning and weaving rooms. One day, she heard a tremendous roar coming from a building. She went inside and saw that men were building a huge iron machine. Maddie opened her notebook and began to sketch. Have you lost your way, little miss? A man asked. This is a machine shop, isn't it? Maddie replied. Well, what does a young girl want here? He asked. I love machines, Maddie said. I guess you must, he replied. Our shop usually repairs looms, but we've been asked to manufacture this locomotive. Maddie's eyes glowed. What's it for? she asked. Why, for the railroad. This is the General Washington. It will haul cars on the New York Central Lines. 
The man's name was Mr. Baldwin. He answered all her questions. Maddie felt very much at home in the machine shop. She told her family what she discovered. Whatever can this lead to? Her mother said, sighing. When Maddie turned 12, she went to work in the mill, rising with a 4.30 bell in the morning and trudging home to the 7.30 bell at night. One day, a shuttle shot off the end of a loom and slammed into a girl's head. The injured girl was Rebecca, who lived next door to Maddie's family. Maddie ran to help. Out of the way, the overseer shouted. Rebecca was carried out while the looms clattered on and the other girls tried not to lose their threads. Nothing ever halted production. Horrible, someone said. It's the fault of the machines. After work, Maddie walked home with her family. She went over and over the sequence of events that had led to the accident. She pictured the shuttle, what it was supposed to do, and how it had gone wrong. A machine was an invention and could always be improved. That evening, there was a vigil for Rebecca. A weaver said it wasn't uncommon for threads to snap, making missiles of the shuttles. Maddie sat scribbling in her notebook. Suddenly, an idea took shape. A metal guard attached to the box plate would stop a shuttle that had run off the track. It was simple. If only she could try it out. Maddie showed her notebook to Mr. Baldwin. My goodness, these are the drawings of a real inventor, he said. And I think your solution is right. I'm going to take it to the boss. The head engineer was impressed and showed Maddie's idea to one of the mill owners. A few weeks passed, Rebecca got better, Then one day, workmen arrived and began installing metal guards on all the looms in every mill in Manchester. The guards worked just as Maddie had designed them to do. Never again would someone be hurt by a runaway shuttle. Oh, Maddie, I'm so proud of you, her mother said. Mr. Baldwin congratulated her. You ought to own a patent on your idea, he remarked. What's a patent? Maddie asked. He explained that inventors registered their ideas with the government to protect them from being stolen. Once patented, an idea could be sold or the inventor could manufacture the device herself. But I guess they wouldn't give a patent to a little girl, he said. Maddie worked in the mill for a few more years. Cotton prices fell and production slowed. I I want to look for a better opportunity, Maddie told her mother when she turned 18. I hate to give you up, said her mother, but I know you must go. Maddie moved away from home and worked in several different factories. Then, after the Civil War, she heard of a job in Springfield, Massachusetts. It was in a factory that mass-produced paper bags that used to be made by hand. Its machines cut paper from long rolls, then folded and pasted each length shut at the bottom like an envelope, but the bags didn't stand upright, and grocers had to use one hand to hold them open for filling. Bulky items tended to split the bags. In Springfield, Maddie shared a room with Sadie, who worked in a shoe factory. Maddie had not been working at the bag factory for very long when a man mentioned that he knew someone who was trying to invent a better machine that could cut and glue a square-bottomed bag. Such a machine would make a far better product. Soon, Maddie heard about others who were trying to invent an improved machine. Maddie decided she must try to invent one herself. She set up a workshop in the basement of her rooming house and sketched possible improvements on the bag machine. Sadie came downstairs to see what Maddie was up to. It's bedtime, she said. Whatever are you doing? Maddie made a notation in her notebook before she answered. Inventing, 
she said. Well, you're not like any girls I ever knew, said Sadie. Maddie explained what she was working on. Sadie took to checking up on her new friend. How is it coming along? We'll see, Maddie would say. Maddie worked and worked on her bag-making machine. She made paper cutout versions of her machine, refining the process by trial and error. There was no end to improving, it seemed, but the day came to try making some bags. She built a prototype machine out of wood using her father's old toolbox. Would it work? When the first bag rolled out, the paper caught. Maddie found the problem and fixed it. Gingerly, she started the machine again. The roll proceeded smoothly. One after another, paper bags poured from her invention. Over the next few weeks, she made several thousand bags, each of them with a flat bottom, enabling it to stand upright and hold bulky groceries without ripping. You've done it, Sadie cried. I have. Maddie agreed. An inventors club had formed in Springfield. Maddie went to a meeting and introduced herself. She told the men she had invented a new machine and wanted to obtain a patent. There's an excellent machine shop in Boston, one of the inventors told her. Have them make an iron prototype to file with the patent office. When Maddie told Sadie, she said, You're going to Boston all by yourself? I have to, Maddie replied. She used some of her savings to rent a room in Boston so that she could supervise the casting and assembly of her machine. I think you've got a money idea here, the shop foreman said. But why doesn't your husband come in and see to this himself? I am the inventor, Maddie said, and you need to recast this part. It doesn't exactly meet my specifications. One day, when she arrived at the shop, a man pushed past her and stormed out the door. At the time, she thought only that he was rude. The prototype took a few weeks longer to complete. It was a moment of triumph when she loaded a roll of paper and proved that her machine produced uniform square-bottomed bags. With the help of a friendly machinist, she carried her invention to the patent office and filled out the paperwork. The clerk read it and handed it back to her. Miss, this has already been patented, only last week. Maddie gazed in bewilderment at the record. Indeed, one Charles F. Anon had submitted a prototype and filed a patent for an identical invention. That's the fellow who was in our shop, said the machinist. He's stolen your idea. Maddie had never felt so discouraged. The clerk said, oh, this looks like a matter for the court. The court, Maddie asked. If you can prove to the judge that this idea is yours, you get the patent. Maddie had to hire a lawyer. It took the rest of her savings. Do you have a notebook? He asked. Maddie said that she had. The lawyer told her to bring Sadie to testify. Maddie had to go to Springfield and persuade Sadie to come to Boston. Mr. Anon took the stand. He told the judge that the invention was obviously his because Miss Knight could not possibly understand the mechanical complexities of the machine. When Sadie took the stand, she was so frightened, she spoke in a whisper. This woman is even less competent than Miss Knight, snorted Charles Anon. Maddie's lawyer asked Sadie if she ever saw Maddie work on her invention. Oh, yes, whispered Sadie. When? asked the lawyer. Every night, for two years, Sadie told him. Then Maddie's lawyer asked her to show the court her drawings, her paper patterns, and the notebook with all of its entries. The judge poured over them. I must compliment you on the entire originality of this machine, he said finally. 
This evidence and the testimony of the witness prove Miss Knight's priority of invention. Mr. Anon shall be forever disgraced in history. Natty beamed and Sadie gave a little cheer. The representative for a manufacturing firm was on hand for the verdict. He offered Maddie $50,000 if she would sell him her invention outright. Maddie didn't hesitate. No thank you, she said. I intend to go into business for myself. She improved the bag machine and applied for another patent. Then she set up the Eastern Paper Bag Company with a business partner. Maddie was a professional inventor for the rest of her life. When she died at the age of 76, her obituary referred to her as the Lady Edison. People still use the paper bags from Maddie's invention every day. The End How about it for one of our greatest American inventors, Margaret E. Knight, marvelous Maddie, and she is marvelous indeed. How about that? Ladies can do it indeed. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I hope you're enjoying yourself as much as I'm enjoying telling these stories to you. We've got more coming your way. So just sit back, relax, and get ready for Hug Me Please by Shemishwaf. Vechterovich, illustrated by Emilia Zubak. One morning, as the sun was still brushing its teeth, Little Bear and Daddy Bear went for a stroll. What shall we do today, Daddy? Little Bear asked. Let's look for some honey, Daddy Bear replied. The honey was delicious. It gave them a warm, sweet feeling inside. I know what we could do now, Little Bear said. Visit Mr. Beaver and give him a big hug. A brilliant idea, son, said Daddy Bear. Be sure to brighten up his day. And off they went. Along the way, they chatted about how lucky they were to have one another. And before they knew it, they had reached Mr. Beaver's. Mr. Beaver was working so hard that Little Bear and Daddy Bear danced to get his attention. Hello, we have come to hug you, said Daddy Bear. Mr. Beaver was frightened. Why? he asked. To brighten up your day, said Little Bear. So Mr. Beaver agreed to a little hug. It felt strange, but nice. Dad, do you think Mr. Beaver liked his hug? Little Bear asked. I think so, Daddy Bear replied. Hugging always makes you feel good. They were heading home when Little Bear pulled his dad's fur. Can we hug someone else now? He asked. Of course. Hugging is a fine way to spend your day. Daddy smiled. Miss Weasel was reading when she heard Little Bear. Excuse me, can we have a hug, please? Miss Weasel jumped. Whew, you almost scared me to death. Little Bear apologized, then hugged Miss Weasel in the most calming way he knew how. Next, they met two hares eating fresh carrots. <clears throat> Daddy Bear said, May we try some of those? The hares froze. Not their precious carrots. Daddy Bear nibbled one carrot. Little Bear nibbled another. I don't like these carrots much, said Daddy Bear. I don't either, said Little Bear. I prefer hugs. The hares were relieved. If you prefer a hug instead of a carrot, we'd be happy to help. The big bad wolf was sharpening his claws. Have you seen a girl in a red hood? He asked. Daddy Bear shook his head. Little Bear smiled. 
We would like to give you a hug, he said. The wolf looked at them suspiciously. All right, but not too hard. The wolf enjoyed the hug so much that he didn't notice a little girl in a red hood skipping past. By the stream, old Mr. Elk was having a drink. W would you mind if we gave you a hug? Little Bear asked. But why hug an old beast like me? Old Mr. Elk said. Because it will make you feel good. Old Mr. Elk had to admit Little Bear's hug was perfect. In a clearing, a stranger was basking in the sun. I didn't know that uh, anacondas lived in our forest, said Daddy Bear. Miss Anaconda hissed gently. I'm visiting Grass Snake. What are you doing? We're hugging everyone we meet, Little Bear piped. Would you like us to hug you? <laughs> Miss Anaconda smiled. It would be my pleasure. Next, they passed through a meadow of sweet-smelling flowers, and Little Bear shouted, Look at that colorful caterpillar! It's like a rainbow! Mrs. Caterpillar sat up. Out of my way! I want to snuggle up in my cocoon. Could I give you one little hug before you go to sleep? Be quick, said Mrs. Caterpillar. So Little Bear hugged her as quickly and as delicately as he could. Behind a bush, the bear spied a hunter. Little Bear whispered, Do you think we can hug him? It would be rude not to, Daddy Bear replied. So they picked up the hunter and hugged him hard. I will look after his net, said Daddy Bear. On their way home, they hugged more animals. Hello, Mr. Badger. This is cozy. Ooh la la, what big muscles. One at a time, children. What a great guy! Wait for us! It was turning out to be one of the best days of Little Bear's life. They were almost home when suddenly Little Bear sat down. Dad, haven't we forgotten someone? Daddy Bear stopped. He counted everyone who lived in the forest. Hmm. I'm pretty sure we hug everyone. But, but Dad, think! Daddy Bear counted again. I give up, son. Who have we missed? Each other, Daddy. And they gave each other the strongest, hardest, longest, largest, and most loving hug of all. The end <laughs> another great story here at ringmaster story time ladies and gentlemen boys and girls i'm so glad you can join me once again and remember yours truly that's right ringmaster himself returns to center ring for lone star circus presents circus aura that's right. So remember to tune in September 26th and 27th for Lone Star Circus Presents Circus Aura. I can't wait to bring it to you. We can't wait to bring it to you. But until then, remember, your dreams matter. You matter. And remember, most of all, keep the circus alive inside you.
mine a lullaby collection. It has been such a fully realized dream for me. As a result of this, we will be able to lull children into dreams of their own and make sure that they know that they're not alone. To listen to the voices make these songs come to life and infuse them with the energy and the love and the comfort is very exciting. That. <laughs> All right. When the album is sold, the money that we raise from that album will go into the Baby Mind Project, which will then go towards helping children across Africa stay safe and well looked after and cared for. The circus is a vast international community, and there's only one place to connect for jobs, events, the latest news, and so much more. CircusTalk.com. Join today.